Welcome to Grub Stakers, the podcast about billionaires. This week we're taking a look at Carl Icahn, the famous corporate raider and one of the inspirations for the Oliver Stone movie Wall Street. Hear all about how he pioneered techniques of asset stripping and how he destroyed TWA, as well as the case he is involved in today where he might have allegedly done insider trading in the Trump White House. All that and more coming up on Grub Stakers. I think we disproportionately stop whites too much. I taught those kids lessons on product development and marketing, and they taught me what it was like growing up feeling targeted for your race. I am proud to be gay. I am proud to be a Republican. You know, I went to a tough school in Queens that they used to beat up the little Jewish boys. You know, I love having the support of real billionaires. Hello, it's Grub Stakers for the week. I'm Sean P. McCarthy here, joined as always by... Andy Palmer. Yogi Polywell. Steve Jeffries. And uh, today on the uh, podcast about billionaires, we are taking a look at Carl Icahn, and we are actually joined today by a very funny comedian, uh, Mr. Jay Welsh. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me. And uh, Jay, in addition to being a, a great comedian, has actually read uh, the biography, King Icon, about Carl Icon. Uh, so he is here today auditioning for Andy's spot on the podcast. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but Carl Icahn, uh, we've mentioned him a little bit on uh, uh, previous episodes, particularly the Bill Ackman one. But um, just to, to give you a brief summary, Forbes uh, puts his net worth at about $19.6 billion as of August 2018. And he has been called a pioneer of, of what's called corporate rating. Uh, corporate rating is uh, uh, briefly the process of buying a stake in a company uh, and then using shareholder rights to essentially... Um, do different measures to increase the value of the company, such as layoffs or uh, restructuring or liquidation, and then exiting your position. And uh, also on the episode also about- Also known as think fluency. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's also been kind of a precursor to uh, private equity, which uh, we, we mentioned a bit on the episode about um, Josh Kosman, or with Josh Kosman. Um, but I guess uh, as far as uh, Icon goes, uh, we should probably start um, from his stand-up set at Carolina. <laughs> uh, I'm telling you, these stories are funnier than, than the jokes you can tell. <laughs> I do like, so yes, he did perform at Caroline's, uh, which is like, you're in a room full of uh, uh, four comedians who have not performed at Caroline's, <laughs> and the guy who... Uh, I'm sorry, are you, all four of you guys are comedians? <laughs> <laughs> It turns out, like, instead of hitting... They have it, independently produced shows, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people perform on independently produced shows at Caroline's. Instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, doing the open mics, we should have just been bankrupting TWA <laughs> to get our start. Um, but so... Yeah, well, well, like, where is his career now? <laughs> right? Show me... Show me how many writing... How many staffs he's been on. I mean, he was going to get a Netflix show, but it got canceled. And, I mean, it was going to be really good, though. Honestly, I thought his work for the break with Michelle Wolf was excellent. <laughs> and it's a tragedy that, that he got fired as consulting producer. I mean, he pulled Big Bang Theory out of a slump yeah. by oh, yeah. diversifying the cast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was he's, his idea. He's being an investigated because he sold all his Netflix stock right before the break got canceled. <laughs> 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 he knew it was coming. <laughs> Um, but so, yes, with, with Carl Icahn, I think what's, what's most fascinating to me about the man is um, just this uh, brief quote from a New Yorker uh, piece that uh, was written on him. And I'll, we'll start there. So Carl Icahn, uh, a few years ago, sold his mega yacht, uh, as according to the New Yorker, because he said cruising on it bored him. Aww. And uh, a reporter asked him years ago why he kept making money when he already had more than he can ever spend. Again, $19.6 billion net worth. And Carl Icahn said, quote, it's a way of keeping score, yeah. end quote. And that's like... I'll give you another one that really happened. <laughs> and that's like all you really need to know about uh, Icahn is like uh, nothing in the world makes him happier uh, at, by his own admission than just being up late at night doing these deals and these financial machinations and stuff. And it's, it's really not as much about the money as it is just like the actual thrill, the art of the deal, you might sure, say. Sure, sure. Um, and uh, when we talk about um, uh, corporate rating and, and all these things, um, 
I guess we should probably mention that uh, Donald Trump has uh, been a a big beneficiary of Icon, or maybe an idol. You know, people talk about how Donald Trump like looks up to uh, these billionaires who are uh, what Donald Trump wants to be. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. And Icon is a relatively self-made billionaire, except for a loan from his uncle. But you could say he's an know, icon. <laughs> there's, he is very heavily a self-made billionaire. Like the percentage of it that's self-made is pretty high. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a. <laughs> it was a. It was a big transfer from the TWA flight attendants to Carl Icon. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. I, like, but but in terms of like money that fa friends and sure, family sure. gave. Him. Yeah, genuinely, he is one of the more self-built uh, billionaires out of the bunch. Self-exploiting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one sign of that is that it took him twenty years to become one. Right. Or not. And not even. It took him twenty years to become someone who had ten million dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And look, with the, with a guy like Carl Icahn, of course, we can say he grew up in at least lower middle class circumstances and he built a fortune with that. But I think it kind of begs larger societal questions, which is like, does the way he made his money actually benefit society? And uh, for their part, uh, Hedge Clippers, which is, again, an anti uh, hedge fund type organization, so maybe they're a little biased, but they looked at 10 deals Carl Icahn was involved in uh, from the 80s up to 2016, and they calculated that Icahn's investments resulted in layoffs of more than 35,000 uh, jobs in major U.S. industries, as well as the elimination of pensions and health benefits for more than 126,000 American families. Well, and again, I'm we, telling you, these stories are funnier than, than the results. <laughs> And, and look, we've uh, we've kind of we've kind of gone through this ad nauseum with regards to private equity, but um, uh, and the corporate raider playbook, which again you can see, Icon was a major inspiration for the Oliver Stone movie Wall Street, mm -hmm. where it is like you come in and you you buy something and then you make these cuts, which are usually layoffs or pension cuts, and then once you've squeezed uh, uh, expenses, now there's more cash flow and you can sell it for a profit. Or in the case of uh, Icon, he engaged in asset stripping, uh, particularly with TWA, where you uh, sell off um, individual divisions with an airline. You, In the case of TWA, you sell some of their flight routes to their competitors, and like these kinds of things that might make you a short-term profit, but are certainly in the case of TWA, damaging to the long-term business. There's a real question to some extent of like what a company is. Right. Like is a company, uh, the shareholders, is a company, uh, the people who work for it, is a company, the business that it does as a business. Mm. And to Carl Icahn, the company is its assets <laughs> uh, that can be uh, sold individually. And if those can be sold for more than the company, then the company does not need to be a going concern. Mm. Right, right. And uh, just to kind of describe uh, Carl Icahn a little bit, um, uh, a quote from the book um, King Icahn is that uh, Mark Stevens, the authors, described Carl Icahn as, quote, a germaphobic, detached, relatively loveless man. And he quoted a contemporary of Icahn's who said that Carl's dream in life is to have the only fire truck in town. Then when your house is in flames, he can hold you up for every penny you have. And so, again, we've just kind of mentioned that he's... Uh, the, the the animating joy in his life is doing business deals, but it's questionable whether or not he has uh, any real friends or, uh, uh, let's say, larger human interests beyond his business. Wait, what was that line? Relatively loveless? What what, what was it? The yeah. beginning of that quote? Relatively loveless? What does that even mean? Yeah. Germophobic, detached, relatively loveless. You, well, know, I, you know, he's married and, you know, they're sort of like saying... But does death. he? They're not saying that there is no love in the marriage, sure, but I sure. think they're like getting Relatively at a like what's loveless. you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is animated by th some other things than self interest. <laughs> <laughs> Just feels like another word for robotic. <laughs> one, one more thing from the uh, uh, New Yorker article is uh, uh, once in a court proceeding, uh, Carl Icahn said, "Quote: If the price is right, we are going to sell. I think that's true of everything you have, except maybe your kids and possibly your wife." <laughs> Uh, and then the judge, the judge asked Icon, possibly question mark, and Icon said possibly, adding, "Don't tell my wife." And then he was later uh, divorced. That was his first wife. That was his yeah, first wife, right, right. which ended in a um, uh, very vicious divorce, and he is now married. It was a brilliant moment for me. One of my happiest moments. <laughs> <laughs> of course, quote that's related. Yeah, sure, sure. So this is also from King Icon. Uh, this is written by. Uh, okay. Quote, observing Carl over the years, I have come to think of him as a bull, snorting and pacing in front of a barbed wire fence. He is always looking for a way to get through that fence, to strike a deal. Although it looks to everyone else as if there's no way out, Carl finds a way. 
That's a quote from Gail, Gil, Gail Golden, that was Icon's executive assistant since 1978. Uh, six years after that quote, she married him. Ah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a bull always looking the way for the way out of his marriage. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're, you know, they, uh, they take baths together. Yeah. They're doing all right. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the divorce was lengthy because uh, she wanted the the uh, Czechoslovakian ballet dancer, I believe. She oh, was. the number of ways in which uh, Carl Icahn's first wife is similar to Ivana Trump is it's uncanny. Hilarious. Yeah, they both married women from Czechoslovakia in the late 1970s. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> they uh, both got divorced for a long time <laughs> in the 1990s. Yeah. They had the same divorce attorney. <laughs> uh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Jay Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like uh, when you look at uh, information about uh, their son Brett Icon on mm-hmm. Wikipedia and stuff, it always says like, "Oh, and his other son Brett Icon." Like it's a very like inclusionary type of sentiment that they have on Wikipedia. I do like that on uh, Brett Icon's Wikipedia article. He is described as a quote philanthropist. Yeah, right, right, right. Which is like, oh, how'd you get that job? <laughs> <laughs> he is not no. a self-made philanthropist. <laughs> to the same, fair to say. Um, but oh, but briefly, can I say, Golden course. was the founder of uh, an organization called Gutsy Women Travel. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, GWT. <G-dub-T. laughs> They were able to get half-off tickets thanks to uh, Carl Icahn's deal with TWA. (laughs) It's an amazing deal. Uh, Also, if you want, on eBay right now, for $10, you can get Stop Carl Icahn Buttons. From TWA? From the TWA, uh, yeah, strikes and stuff. If you want to buy buttons that don't work. (laughs) You know know what you can't buy from uh, from eBay? Is a flight from St. Louis to New York. (laughs) $25. (laughs) Um, and so we'll get into the TWA case more uh, in a little bit here. But um, uh, just to do the Trump thing briefly, uh, while Trump was campaigning for the presidency, he uh, uh, repeatedly said that he would make Carl Icahn the U.S. Treasury Secretary. Mm-hmm. Uh, Icahn, for his part, said, quote, I am flattered, but I do not get up early enough in the morning to accept this opportunity. But of course, according to another failed Trump campaign. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was at a point in his campaign where Trump was sufficiently unpopular, right? That Trump was like waving around a good relationship with our Carl Icahn <laughs> to win as as like a, this is a sign of a seriousness of purpose, <laughs> right? 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 <laughs> you know that guy responsible for thirty five thousand layoffs. <laughs> uh, well, his Q factor is a little better than mine. <laughs> I will say the Chamber of Commerce never found Trump more relatable. <laughs> You know, if, uh, if you're trying to get credibility with business conservatives. Yeah. Right, right. Um, but just on the Treasury Secretary point, and uh, we'll probably circle back to this, but Carl Icahn, during the transition, apparently uh, interviewed uh, Trump's uh, uh, tr- uh, Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary. He interviewed mm-hmm. Scott Pruitt, the former EPA director now. And he also interviewed Jay Sekulow. Uh, oh, Jay Clayton. No, uh, Yeah, the uh, SEC guy. Yes, yes. Um, uh, so, the guy, the head of the SEC and the head of the Secretary of the Treasury and right. the head of the EPA. You can see why, uh, and these people have uh, wide regulatory oversight of Carl Icahn's business. So yes. you can see why him uh, being part of the job interview process. Right. Like the way the New Yorker article describes it is these people would literally, in the case of Scott Pruitt, met Trump, and then at the end of the meeting, Trump said, Okay, now you got to go two blocks uptown to have an interview with Carl Icahn. <laughs> Yeah, you thought this interview was on 57th Street. It is on 57th Street and 59th Street. Um, But I guess... We'll be right back. Uh, Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. (laughs) Uh, But but we can return to all that, because I want to start um, generally chronologically with uh, uh, Carl Ike on the man and, you know, how he became what he is and uh, today and, and these kinds of things. And... Just for a brief biography, and uh, Jay, you've read the book, so please sure. jump in at any point and Thank you. Uh, add color to our commentary here. But um, <laughs> Carl Icahn was born in 1936 in uh, Far Rockaway, Queens, and um, he uh, was the only child. Richard Feynman's <laughs> stopping around. Uh, he, was the, he was an only child born near the end of the Great Depression, and an interesting revealing quote um, from uh, the New Yorker profile was that uh, throughout his youth... Uh, Carl Icahn's father railed against the robber barons, condemning the concentration of extreme wealth. Uh, Icahn told uh, the biographer Mark Stevens, quote, the social juxtaposition of a tiny group of people living in great splendor and many more living in abject poverty was anathema to him, to his father. Can I add uh, another quotation that uh, Carl Icahn had? Uh, Mm -hmm. This is from The New Yorker. Yes. Um, 
he also said, it was quite looking, quote, my father was never able to accomplish anything. Yes. I never respected him. Exactly. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, these stories are funnier than, than the jokes you can tell. <laughs> uh, yeah, but so you see that kind of contrast where uh, his father, um, again, so it's a lower middle, fa- uh, lower middle class family in Far Rockaway, Queens. His mother was a school teacher. His father was a, uh, according to uh, the New Yorker, a failed opera singer. Um, and even though he was an atheist, he became the cantor in a local synagogue because he loved the music. He also worked part time as a school teacher. But this is kind of a lower middle. Never accomplished anything. <laughs> Sweet. He raised a fucking billionaire. <laughs> right, right. That was enough. He for taught Mike. him. He, he <laughs> failed un- to give him the sense of right and wrong that enabled him to become a billionaire. He was a part-time <laughs> teacher, but unfortunately, he raised Carl Icahn. <laughs> if, if Carl Icahn's dad had been uh, had been better at accomplishing things, those people at TWA would still be flighted. <laughs> <laughs> um, they probably wouldn't. The, the odds that we'd have a fourth airline is <laughs> vanishingly small. Not happening. Um, but that th- company would have gone out of business in 2008 <laughs> instead of 2001. <laughs> Warren Buffett has anything to say about it. He owns all the airlines. Go ahead, listen to our Buffett episode. Um, but so continuing from this story uh, in the New Yorker profile is basically Icon was, you know, like a smart student. And um, he was offered a scholarship to Woodmere Academy, which is a, a private school in Long Island. Uh, but his parents... Uh, decided they worried that the values of a private school would uh negatively impact him so what kind of school is that a private school uh what kind of private school uh i don't know a tough one oh it was a jewish private school uh woodmere academy i I don't know actually i don't think so i think you know i went to a tough school in queens that they used to beat up the little jewish boys well so that's the school that (laughs) that he went went to that he went to yeah he went to the public school he attended Far Rockaway High School, uh, which he has described as a tough school in Queens, <laughs> where they used to beat up the little Jewish boys. He's just bitter because Richard Feynman would like beat the shit out of I him think every day. I think what you're saying, Sean, is that Andy had the drop on you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it, it is interesting. I can't. <laughs> it is interesting where uh, the fact that his parents decided not to send him to this private school that he got a scholarship for clearly stuck with him and then again according to the new yorker uh half a century later in the heat of high stakes negotiation icon would occasionally digress to inform his adversaries that although he attended public school instead of woodmere academy he still went on to become a billionaire although he attended princeton university (laughs) (laughs) instead of a different ivy league school (laughs) he still went on to become very successful (laughs) Which also, you know, he went to Far Rockaway and then got into Princeton. Mm-hmm. Very impressive, yeah. Right. And um, uh, so, yeah, and this kind of continues. He goes to this Far Rockaway, this tough school in Queens, <laughs> and uh, his uh, parents say to him that they will pay for his college assuming he gets into um, an Ivy League. And they, uh, he believes that they didn't think that he could actually do that, but he did get into Princeton, and uh, his father... Um, uh, paid for him uh, to go there, but he didn't pay like room and board. And interestingly enough, there's a uh, there's an interview that Carl Icahn does in 2015 for Wall Street Week with Anthony Scaramucci, <laughs> where Carl Icahn uh, hey. breaks down crying uh, because uh, Scaramucci was cutting up onions for the sauce or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, or he at least tears up a little bit, um, uh, th- telling the story of his father. Um, and the way Carl Icahn explains it is essentially uh, as l- near the late 70s when he started to become, you know, successful on Wall Street, um, he says that his father never asked him for what he did for a living or how he did it. But then in a visit to uh, his parents in Florida, uh, he-, he says his father pulled him aside, hugged him uh, and handed him a yellow notepad and said, quote, here, explain to me what you do. And Icon said, Icon, the way he tells it, he says, I hugged him and said, you finally admit it. It still makes me cry for some reason. <laughs> that, for some reason. Yeah. I think that's a pretty straightforward reason. Yeah. 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 This scene, again, like, I don't think he's like a total sociopath. Mm-hmm. There's there's people where there's no, like, Certainly, emotions yeah. or remorse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He just, um, it's not like he's misguided or misjudging the situation, but it's like, no, your dad admits that he wants to know what you do with your life. Like that's that's emotional. <laughs> and in also, itself. like if you're not working as an options trader, 
it's hard to understand yeah. exactly what that is, right. maybe. Hmm. And that's before you get to the really complicated jobs right, you right, have. Right. Would you be able to actually write it down for your for your guys' dads? <laughs> <laughs> what you do what do you do? Well, you'd like, be pretty hilarious to just see that on one page. <laughs> <laughs> for me anyway. Go he, to a podcast. He uh, drew, he drew a picture of flight attendants and then a directional arrow with the dollar signs going from them <laughs> to him. <laughs> By the way, yeah. his parents... Also, also, you're, you're leaving out the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> I like that he's kind of bitter that his parents didn't pay for room and board when he yes. went to Princeton with, in a time where that was like $5. Right, right, right. <laughs> but also, like, Princeton at the time was a very snobby place. Yeah. They were oh, not particularly yeah. friendly to Jews. And there was a very, like, hierarchical thing with, like, what the best eating clubs were and right, stuff right, like that. Right. So, yeah, there's, it's not insane that there's a chip even within that privilege. Icon says, quote, my parents never thought I'd amount to too much. Um, and they were just really mad he didn't become a doctor. <laughs> no, seriously. That's right. no, that's yeah. right. Like he enrolled, he enlisted in the army mm-hmm. after he, he, dro- he went to med school for two years. Mm-hmm. And then he dropped out of med school because he could not stand the sight of blood. And he was a germaphobe. And a germaphobe, which are both very bad things in a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I would say one of those is a deal breaker. <laughs> Either of right. those is a deal breaker. And eventually he was like, he I could just... have been a real Dr. Spichemin. Like, ew, <laughs> ew, 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 ew. <laughs> People kept telling him, all right, you're going to look at this guy who has TB, and you're going to look at his symptoms. And he's like, I don't want to look at a guy who has TB. <laughs> I could get TB, which is an understandable feeling, yep. but very bad at a doctor. <laughs> and so he dropped out of med school after two years. And then he was like, if I'm not in med school, my mom is going to make me jo- go back to med school. Right. This is like, you know, when you're 22 mm-hmm. and you think your parents still have power over you. Right, mm-hmm. right. You know, and, and to some extent they do. Uh, so he enlisted in the army reserves because if he was in the army, the army was the only thing stronger than his mother's desire for him to go to med school. Right, right. I like how his uh, traumatic experience uh, with medicine led him to uh, prevent hundreds of thousands of Americans from having the same experience by destroying their health insurance. <laughs> I'm telling you, these stories are funnier than, than the jokes you can tell. Uh, but so the story is, because his dad wouldn't pay for room and board at uh, Princeton, Icon got a summer, this is from Business Insider, Icon got a summer job at a, as a cabana boy <laughs> at the Malibu Beach Club, and then he says there he started playing poker with the guests, and by the end of the summer he had uh, earned himself $2,000. And this is in the early 60s, well past the 750 he needed for room and board. He also claims that by the time he left college, he had amassed about $10,000 playing poker. And uh, he also was a uh, formidable chess player as a youth who uh, says he could have gone on to be a grandmaster, but there was no money in it. Uh, but um, we mentioned... But print- there was high-profile anti-Semitism. <laughs> uh, Th- that's not... Uh- a Jew, that's a knight, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> it's offensive of you to even think like that. I, I'm repulsed. Come on, Andy. We have a guest here today, all right? Keep that talk for the episodes where we don't have guests. You are deadly serious. <laughs> Andy, you can, I'm fine with you saying stuff like that on an episode that Jews don't <laughs> listen to. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I like, wait, wait, I like the idea. You go on YouTube to watch like Bobby Fisher chess strategies, and then the next suggested video is Bobby Fisher thoughts on the global conspiracy. <laughs> you think it'd be like YouTube gets you gradually more extreme. And it starts with like Bobby Fisher chess strategies, and eventually it's like, okay, this is how you're going to take the company private. <laughs> um, but hiding in the background but under the Trump administration they've come uh, right I can't get enough of Bobby Fisher anti semitism you know agree to disagree <laughs> <laughs> he was Jewish and he claimed that people who said he was Jewish were spreading CIA lies <laughs> Here's how detached I am from that. I just w- r- wish that somebody had recorded him with a better microphone. <laughs> <laughs> you, meet him in, you meet him in person and it still sounds like <laughs> There's a delay. <laughs> I, I think Bobby Fisher is at his best when people are searching for the idea. Of That's where uh, I am. Um, but so... Uh, uh, Bob, College. Yeah. Bobby... Uh, Carl Icahn. <laughs> sure. He studies philosophy at mm-hmm. Princeton. According to The New Yorker, he writes a thesis titled, quote, the problem of formulating an adequate explication of the empiricist criterion of meaning, mm-hmm. which uh, I'm already confused. Yeah, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> it means basically 
that there is no such thing in meaning as results. Hmm. It's a huh. it's a very cold blooded way of breaking down. It's saying that when you look at a company, all it is is assets. Mm. It really, it's very similar. Huh. There's a real through line to it. So is it like the value of something is not the result of it, but what it is in... in, in, in... The, it's saying there's no meaning but data, basically, okay, is gotcha. the, the argument. And it was a very successful. Like, it was a, an award-winning thesis huh. at Princeton. And that's kind just, of Milton Friedman-y, like, uh, just kind of the looking at nothing or the economy in terms of just like the numbers in the market sean's shaking the, the numbers of helicopters flying over pinochet's regime <laughs> um but the numbers of bombs I will dropped say, on I, uh, credit where it's due carl icon has largely stayed out of the military industrial complex hmm. well it's he, nice to hear a billionaire hasn't contributed to once <laughs> he left that to the carlisle group um <laughs> But yeah, no, I just like the idea of like all the laid off workers receiving uh, their severance notice and then a copy of his thesis along with it. <laughs> no, he's like this. This no, will help console you. No, you're, you're, you're Your confusing. job is meaningless. No, he's, he, you're confusing things because he's only interested in profit. He's not interested in cruelty <laughs> as an end in itself. Right. He would only do that if he thought that cruelty would advantage. Right, he, look, right, right. He, he happily inflicts fear and anguish into people. Yeah but only for the purposes of reducing their negotiating skills. Right, right, right. <laughs> Once the deal is done, he, he's happy to have a drink with them. There is um, a quote. Uh, I believe it's from Fortune or Business Insider. Apologies if I misquoted it. But I mean, if he's against cruelty, wh- how do you explain this Caroline He's not against set? cruelty. <laughs> but he's, he, he does, he's, not a, he's not for cruelty as an end in itself. Again, how do you explain this Caroline set? <laughs> you know, I, I got to say, Andy, there is a probably problem with formulating an adequate explication of the empiricist <laughs> criteria <laughs> of me. Um, but so, um, oh, yeah, well, there's a story from Hedge Clippers, which was he was involved in a deal with Family Dollar, uh, and he invited the CEO to his, um, his, either his office or his penthouse. And when the CEO of Family Dollar got there, uh, Carl Icahn was making him an alcoholic drink, and the CEO says, no, I, I better not drink. I, I, I should probably keep my wits about me for this. And uh, Carl Icahn told him, not drinking is not going to help you here, so you might as well have a drink. <laughs> uh you know, I mean, he kind of intimidates people that way. Carl Icahn is also, also the same person who will start a meeting at 9 p.m. <laughs> and then show up to the meeting two hours late. <laughs> and between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m., he took a nap. <laughs> I thought you were going to say he got a couple sets in. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're, we're Again, he's neither a sadist nor a masochist. This is actually him uh, talking about one of those meetings. Uh, www.blowme.com. <laughs> You know, we just I had would, that. That was queue. actually him. <laughs> it was Dennis Leary. Dennis oh, that's much better. That's. <laughs> you know, given a it choice, it did sound like Bill Hicks. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, so uh, Carl Icahn, as we've mentioned, he tried medical school. It wasn't mm-hmm. for him. He was in the Army Reserve for a second, but it's 1961. He gets his start on Wall Street. He's working at Dreyfus uh, for a bit. And uh, Jay, I know you've read the book. If uh, you're able to, maybe. I know he's working at Wall Street in the early 60s, and then 1968, he goes off on his own. Uh, anything notable kind of happen in between those times? I will say, so briefly, so, you know, it's like living in, his parents live in Outer Borough, New York. He's living in uh, an apartment on the east side because mm-hmm. he got his first job as an options trader. And, you know, the market was doing pretty well. There was a correction, and things got a little tight for him money-wise. Mm-hmm. And he's, like, terrified of moving back home. Mm-hmm. Because if he moves back home, his mother's going to pressure him to go to med school. Right. Uh, <laughs> his, this episode is surprisingly <laughs> relatable. <laughs> his mother said the only way he could we, go... We're both trying to get to Caroline's. <laughs> we're both terrified of failing and having to go back to our parents' house. I like that his main driving factor is that blood is Neither achy. of you employs flight attendants anymore. <laughs> Right, so his mother said the only way he could go home is if he went to med school again. This is after he's been an options trader for a couple of years. Right. After he tried med school for two years and hated it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so is to avoid the fate of going back home, he, quote, cut a deal with a middle-aged acquaintance in search of a discreet setting for romantic liaisons. In return for rent, quote, subsidies, half the rent. Carl had to abandon the apartment for hours at a time while his boarder entertained women. <laughs> so this was like a friend who was like, 
having hookups in his apartment. Yes. <laughs> this is in 1962, which means he took the... So you're telling he, me... He's so good at profit, he saw the movie The Apartment and said, that's a way to make money. <laughs> <laughs> it means the movie The Apartment is true and it's about Carl Icahn, and I, that's important. I just like the idea in 1962, Carl Icahn invented Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, sorry, so 60 to 62, he was working as a straight-up broker, and then after the correction, he got into options trading. Very narrow point, sorry. I'm just imagining uh, his friend leaves the apartment and then says to Carl Icahn, what is happiness? <laughs> is it that thing we get before we want more happiness? <laughs> um, <laughs> but so... It's weird. I will say Carl Icahn to me much, looks much more like a character in MASH than a character in Mad Men. Yeah. Like, he looks like if you averaged sure. all the yep. psychologists that Hawkeye saw. Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, but so uh, in the 60s, he's mm -hmm. working on Wall Street, and um, uh, in 1968, he sets off on his own. He sets up, I believe it was called Icon, Carl Icon and Co. It might have had a different name, but essentially, um, <clears throat> the the way uh, Jay explained it to us uh, earlier was he had a wealthy uncle who who married rich. And this uncle loaned him the 400000 necessary that was necessary to get a seat on the stock exchange at this point so that yeah. you could execute trades. And then this uncle took, you know, a percentage, uh, his own kickback for that. So, like, yeah. well, it's a deal. Not right, a of Kickback course. is, yes, yes. Uh, I think, a, a ch charge word there. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, like, he's like a successful options trader in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And by the late 60s, he's earning like $350,000 a year, which is a lot of money, mm -hmm. but also not millions. Right. And it's also the kind of money where it's still hard to like just plop down 400000 mm -hmm. His right. uncle was able to, and so they had that arrangement. Uh, like, I think it's possible that if his uncle didn't exist in that scenario, like he could have made it happen some other way. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. But it also, you know, doesn't hurt to have a well-to-do uncle sometimes. Yep. His friends and family LLC. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, but so, uh, and then my understanding, uh, again, uh, I haven't read the book, so I don't know as much about this early period, but it, uh, according to the New Yorker profile, he was involved to an extent in the RJR Nabisco deal, which was a famous leveraged buyout in the 1980s, uh, uh, which was profiled in the book Barbarians at the Gate, led to a lot of uh, criticism of leveraged buyouts, which are now called uh, private equity, and, you know, these kinds of, corporate rating essentially um but it's uh he, I mean, he's one of the raiders at the time right. and so he's one of the people that like those companies are looking at although he was not the boat that specifically boarded rjr nabisco yeah mm -hmm. he like he innovated the process right. oh very place. much so yeah well not just but not just already in place like he was one of the people who helped figure out to make it a process right yeah. like he was looking at undervalued opportunities this sort of gap between the whole and the parts where the, the company, parts add up to more than the, the whole. The company's right. replacement value is like where it's more than their share price. If, yeah, if right. You strip it the, in. the assets are worth more than the actual stock price yeah. currently reflects. So you go and you buy up the stock and then you can sell off the assets or do something well, like that. Well, there's sort of a lot of different ways to make money. Yes. Once you, if you take a, if you think, think a company is selling for more per share, selling for less per share than the value of the raw assets is, you can by by taking up a share in it. Carl Icahn's idea was that you can basically stir up enough shit to freak enough people out that they will do stuff to make the price of the company go up to match its true value. Right, right. And then you will make money whatever happens. Mm -hmm. So you can make money that way if you end up buying the company. You can make money that way if they pay you to go away, which yes. is called green mail. Right. Uh, you can make money that way if they find another person who will buy the company just to get you out of their hair. That's called a white knight who comes in and rescues the company mm -hmm. is the idea. And then you make money that way. Bobby you can also pay money if they get... Yeah, yeah. You can also make money that way if the company itself gets more proactive about raising its stock price and succeeds in raising its stock price and then you just own a stock that went up. Right. So right. for Carl Icahn, is he's happy to make money any of those ways. Mm -hmm. He finds the undervalued company, he invests in it, and then he goes to the management and says, you are not doing a good job of being management, and I have ideas about how you should change his management. Right. Management gets wigged out, and then that is leads to a rise in share price in any of those ways, and he wins any of those ways. One of one of the like results... like. One of the upshots in the economics profession, anyway, just as a side of mm -hmm. all of this, is uh, popular. Um, the economist James Tobin made a 
a new measure of like the mar- sort of like the fair value hmm. of a company by saying like, well, if it's at if the replacement cost of the company, all of its hard assets is higher than its market share value, like it, it became known as like the Tobin Q value. Okay, mm-hmm. and so uh, people started people like Icon started tracking like the Tobin Q of the market. Hmm. So it tries to estimate all of the underlying asset value versus what it's trading for. Hmm. He has a stand-up bit about this. The jury comes back and says $12 billion of damages. So now Texaco got to pay $12 billion. They don't have $12 billion. But it's a great company. The stock used to be 60 The stock goes down to 25 And I buy all the stock I can buy because I figure somebody's going to sell this goddamn thing. So I buy all this stock. And now I own all the stock at Texaco. And it was a brilliant moment for me, one of my happiest moments. You know, listening to his storytelling abilities, I understand why Donald Trump likes him. <laughs> I just like very similar me. style. The, the punchline <laughs> is that his life is devoid of <laughs> right, right. joy. I was actually uh, happy for five Jerry. minutes. Yes. Yes. I I have just realized that Jerry Seinfeld is not technically the richest stand-up comedian <laughs> of all time. Um, oh, man. <laughs> what, what, so one thing briefly, What's which is the in- deal with eminent domain laws that applies <laughs> to corporate rating. <laughs> one thing which is briefly is, is interesting about the sort of being this corporate raider and yes. like the boat you're approaching, freaking out when it sees the raid coming towards it. Right, right, right is uh, it really sort of changes the way you think about management in this context, right? We we often think about like labor versus management. And the lefties tend to think uh, labor is more sympathetic and management is always looking for ways to F over labor. Um, and there's some of you that. You can swear here. I, I know I can. I, I chose to say F for so it seemed more effective. <laughs> um, uh, but, but Carl Icahn, as an owner, is treating management like labor. Right, management right. is labor to him. And management kind of often doesn't know how to handle that. Mm-hmm. They're not. And sometimes the management, the CEOs, are genuinely acting in the interest of the company. Sometimes the CEOs are acting kind of in their own interests and like funneling a little off to them, or they're just or they like being in power because they like how pow- being in power feels. And right. they worked for twenty years to be head of the company. They don't want to get kicked out. And so, their what that company means to them. Sometimes it lines up with shareholder value, but sometimes it doesn't line up with shareholder value. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, an interesting dynamic. Well, two things on that. First, just to go back to Green Mail, you mentioned, and uh, Carl Icahn uh, has grown such a notorious reputation as a corporate raider that Green Mail (laughs) happens when essentially he or somebody like him buys a stake in a company, and then the management or the company will buy back those shares at a premium to make him go away. That's Green Mail because they're afraid of him, they're afraid of what he might do to their company, and that's another way that he can make money. But uh, uh, the other part of that is corporate raising. By the way, and that's not, sometimes Carl Icahn will say, what I'm doing is good for shareholders uh, because it's raising the value of the company for all the shareholders. Right, right. And sometimes it does. But in the case of Greenmail, that's money that's coming out of the company, out of the wallets of all the shareholders to pay just his shareholders. Right. And it's a pretty quick turnaround, too. Yeah. Yeah. So when Carl Icahn is draping himself in the virtue of shareholder activism, that is a thing he drapes himself in when it is advantageous to him and is a cloak he removes quickly when it is no longer advantageous. Well, that was the other thing I was going to mention is that uh, Carl Icahn, you know, he used to embrace this reputation as a corporate raider. The book King Icahn is about him as a corporate raider. Mm -hmm. He apparently used to... Uh, keep copies of it to give out to really? people at his office. I believe that. Yeah. Uh, but since that time, he's kind of adopted the term activist investor mm-hmm. or shareholder activist mm-hmm. instead of corporate raider. So he argues that he produces, you know, billions of dollars uh, for the shareholders, mm-hmm. which, again, occasionally he does. But a lot of times his interests don't line up with general yeah. shareholders. And they certainly very rarely, in my uh, reading, line up with the actual labor or sometimes the long-term health of the company. Very often he the does- long-term health. He does have an interesting sort of fuller sense of what a corporation is mm-hmm. as far as like the division between control versus ownership. Yeah. So like the managers are all about control, right? And then there often, are ownership yeah, yeah. and they can often be at odds with each other as well as labor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so someone like I can, can very like, uh, he's very shrewd Yeah. in how he attacks this problem of like being, uh, like winning a proxy fight or something. Mm-hmm. Mm. And he's pitting, you know, dividing your enemies is probably about as important as uniting your friends in a corporate raid. And sometimes one one thing he'll do is he'll make people more afraid of another enemy. Mm-hmm. And once they're enough afraid of that enemy, right. then they're willing to live with him. And they'll, like, the 
uh, in the TWA, mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason he was able to gain control of TWA is the unions were so afraid of the other guy who might take over the company. Muhammad Ada. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, based on his track record, they were right. <laughs> <laughs> 15 of the 19 shares in that company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, you, you, I think you called a corporation a going concern a while ago. Yeah, and yeah. that has a long history and sort of like kind of the outside sort of the heterodox economics. Like what is a corporation? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that uh, goes, like, literally goes back to his yeah. thesis of like what is the meaning of the right, thing? Right. Is the meaning of the thing so, like, they don't... to be for shareholders? Is the meaning of the thing to be a business that flies people to places? Like the corporate person, like one of the reasons, one of their obligations, mm -hmm. I guess, as a, a legal person is they, mm -hmm. have a, they have a responsibility to shareholders. Yes. And that's like a legal structure on its own right. Yes. But they're like in sort of a fuller sense, it's a going concern in that they have lots of different obligations and to people who control the company as well as ownership. Yeah, well, and so the those arguments are one of the ways that all of these battles play out, and they play out differently with each company because each company is operating in a different circumstance, has its own balance sheet and its own interests, its own politics. Yeah, but it, it is not just rational self interest that drives these companies. Sure. One mm -hmm. of the things that often will happen, and and management sometimes is literally trying to maximize management's power right. at the expense of shareholders, and so when Carl Icahn comes in in cases like that. Uh, often what he's doing is genuinely good for the other shareholders. He'd be fine if it didn't play out that way, and they just paid him to go away, though. Mm. Um, one, of the com one of the very first companies he invests in is a company that makes ovens, made ovens in Ohio, called Tappan. And that company fought him off. Bobby Fischer said it didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> go home, <girl. laughs> And that company really did not like him coming in, and they were very threatened by him. And it was a family-owned company. It had been, like, Public, it was publicly traded, but it was family owned. And family mm -hmm. had bought the bulk of it, um, and eventually there was a white knight that came in, and everyone ended up making money. Who was a shareholder, and uh, the guy who was the head of that company, Dick Tappan, ended up becoming an investor in the next few companies that Carl Icahn raided because he was like, "This guy yeah. makes money." Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, well, there's a, a, <laughs> if you're if what he's doing is making you money, it's fine. If what he's doing is putting you out of business by making himself money. It's not as good. Right. And so he's had a long career. There's a lot of different individual cases. Of course, mm -hmm. we're not sure. going to be able to get to all of them. But I do want to kind of uh, jump around here. So we said 1968, he sets up shop on sure, his sure. own. Uh, 87, he sets up what is still today called Icon Enterprises LP. That's his company. He owns, as of 2016, about 93% of it. But I want to talk, unless Jay has something else uh, uh, worthwhile that happens between 68 and 1985, uh, in 1985, he uh, buys a 20% stake in TWA, and this we've kind of been mentioning, but it is one of his most, at least publicly, significant deals. Sure. Uh, Very briefly. Of course. There's a company called Anchor Hawking, and I'm not getting into the whole thing about them. Uh, they were in 80, 1982, and this is after he'd made a bit of a reputation that he would buy large stakes in companies and say he was coming after them and wanted changes in them. Mm -hmm. And after he did that, and you have to file this public public filing with the SEC, uh, announcing you have a 5% stake in a company and mm -hmm. what your intentions are relative to that company. Like the SEC was like the company's parent and asking what you were going to do right, with their right, daughter. Right. Um, and so... He, uh, Back like, home by 10, please. Exactly. <laughs> Icon's assistant, or, or his chief lieutenant is a guy named Kingsley. Uh, and Kingsley uh, said the company, after Icon bought 5% or whatever, uh, the company called us first. They said, we know you have your, our stock, and we want to buy it. I mean, it was like taking candy from a baby. <laughs> wow. So, <laughs> so he, even before TWA, he has this, this reputation before, as yeah. a raider? Very That's... prominent reputation. Yeah. He's taking down company after company. Some one Goodrich, uh, which is the tire company, mm. pay, he made like $40 million in a very short amount of time getting money from them. The phrase, taking candy from a baby... Uh, reminds me of how Monty Burns got shot, right? <laughs> which is why I wanted to mention that. Well, and also people have described this practice as essentially extortion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh. if you are paying somebody to go away, that is essentially extortion. Right, if, so there's like, if there's the white knight path, or there's the green male path, or there's the path where Carl Icahn takes over the company, or there's the path where uh, the management buckles down and like does the work to raise the company's stock price, and any of those work, mm -hmm. they're all kind of good paths for Carl Icahn. But the green mail path is the one that's good for only Carl Icahn. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, so uh, TWA, 1995, he buys this 20% stake. And again, you might um, you might not d- agree with, you know, three. 1995 or 1985? 85. 85. Um, and you might not agree with some of our attacks on Carl Icahn, but uh, you might take it from Larry Summers, Bill Clinton's Treasury Secretary, certainly not a communist. He described uh, Icahn's TWA profits as, quote, essentially a transfer of wealth from existing flight attendants to Icahn. And that's from Hedge Clippers. Um, and so the the story, again, according to Hedge Clippers, with TWA, they blame him for 22,000 layoffs, 36,000 pensions destroyed or transferred to the federal government, essentially. And um, the, the, Was that when they went under? Uh, yes. they In 2001, he unloaded, essentially, their pension. So it is a long story of him and TWA, but it begins in 1985. He buys a 20% stake, and then he takes the company private. Uh, from a public company. He makes it private. According to Hedge Clippers, he makes $469 million on that deal, but TWA is now saddled with $540 million in debt. And we've mentioned uh, on the private equity episodes how a strategy of private equity is to rack up debt on companies, which um, is occasionally used to pay back dividends, um, but generally just to kind of offset the cost of actually buying the company for the raider. Um, And so... At the time, 4,000 flight attendants lost their jobs, um, and uh, Icon uh, made some sexist comments, let's say. Uh, basically, he said that when dealing with, the, according to Hedge Clippers, when dealing with uh, the 85% female unit uh, union, the flight attendants union, he said flight attendants were, quote, not breadwinners like mechanics and therefore could afford to take deeper cuts. And uh, wow. he, he also <laughs> said, I'm telling you, these stories are funnier than, than the jokes you can tell. <laughs> uh, he also, uh, during the negotiations with the, the um, flight attendants union, he suggested that if flight attendants were having such trouble making ends meet, they, quote, should have married a rich husband. That's according to The New Yorker. Um, he, for his part, has denied making those comments. I'll give uh, you another one that really happened. <laughs> 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 I do like the idea of him having a very original take on airlines for his stand-up bit. (laughs) (laughs) Um, His his idea of airline food is he eats the airline. (laughs) (laughs) Carl Icahn's an innovator because he's the one who made the airline food shitty. (laughs) He changed the generation of comedians' takes. That's that's food bits. (laughs) Get the dr- That's who we got Caroline's. He was like, you owe me. <laughs> um, but so uh, he takes the company uh, private, uh, makes a bit of money. Uh, he takes it private in 1988. Um, and then he starts behaving in a way that a lot of people have accused of being much more interested in making himself money than the long-term profits of the company. In 1991, he sells TWA's London routes to American Airlines. And uh, according to Hedge Clippers, this was for $445 million, which many people believe was heavily undervalued. You know, these are very profitable flight routes. And they were also a core part of what was profitable about the company as a yes. whole. So essentially, he's selling off these uh, uh, asset stripping, as yeah, yeah. We've, we've mentioned, is uh, TWA is kind of a um, case study in asset stripping. In fact, if you go to the Wikipedia article on asset, stri- asset stripping, they say that uh, TWA is a case study in asset stripping. Um, but uh, And then a year later, 1992, TWA files from bankruptcy. And interestingly enough, usually you would expect owners to get wiped out in bankruptcy, but Carl Icahn uh, uh, is one of the creditors in the bankruptcy oh, wow. court. So he uh, emer- it emerges from bankruptcy with creditors owning 55% of the co- company. Again, this is according to Hedge Clippers. One of those creditors was Carl Icahn, who owned $190 million of the company's debt. Um, and so in 93, there's a lot of criticism. In fact, in 91, uh, Congress passes some sort of law to try and make it so he's not able to welsh out of his obligation to the TWA employees for their pensions. He's later able to kind of do an end run around this. Um, but in 1993, he steps down as a chairman of TWA, but he still gets impatient for his $190 million to be repaid. So they come up with... By the way, you should step down as chairman after you've driven a company in bankruptcy. <laughs> right, right, right. That's very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you would think so, but uh, since we started doing the podcast, <laughs> we have learned that uh, sometimes you make a hundred-some million dollars 
and uh, uh, you know these kinds of things. But uh, oh, he, whatever he had leverage, he used as leverage. Yes, that's that's what he did. Um, but so according to uh, Hedge Clippers, position is. they come up to pay back Carl Ike on his 190 million. They come up with the Car- Caribou Ticket Agreement, which is pretty insane to me. But it, it allows Carl Icon to buy any ticket that connect it through St. Louis for 55 cents on the dollar, and then resell them at a discount on his website, lowestfare.com, which is today Priceline. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and uh, they say, Hedge Clippers, the deal allowed uh, Icon to bleed TWA dry by making it compete against itself. And uh, <clears throat> and so instead of just owing them, oh, instead of TWA owing Icon, reorganized TWA right. owing Icon $200 million, they get like 50 or $100 million stripped out of their finances mm-hmm. for years and years. Mm-hmm. Basically and, until they don't exist anymore. Yes. And so, uh, like and then... T-form. Yes, in two yes. Th- in 2001, TWA announces its third bankruptcy, um, and then they get purchased by American Airlines, which results in more massive job cuts for TWA workers. Um, and then two years after the merger, uh, uh, oh yeah, no, in 2001, the writing's on the wall at exactly. that point, pretty sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then 2001, uh, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which is the federal uh, government agency that essentially takes up pensions that are not able to be funded by the private sector, uh, they assume responsibility for all of the pensions that ICON was supposed to uh, still be able to pay up, uh, which, again, is the wipeout of more than 36,000 pensions. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, that's about the story of TWA and... Uh, why you no longer fly on that airline. <laughs> can, I, can I read a quotation? Of from, course. Yeah. Uh, this is Icon in uh, 1985, uh, before he became head of TWA, mm-hmm. when he's still fighting to take ownership of it. There's a hearing at the House Subcommittee on Aviation, because TWA is trying to get some legislation that would make it harder for him to take over the company. And Icon testifies, quote, TWA's management continues to claim that I would seriously damage or even destroy the airline. This would make me both a liar and a fool, and I am neither. My reputation as a man of my word is something I would not risk for any transaction. (laughs) He would later go on to tell the New Yorker, no, I did not engage in insider trading. (laughs) He also said, I'm a man of my word. I promise that I will not perch on Long Island with an anti-aircraft missile (laughs) and shoot down a Boeing 747 in this airline traveling from jfk to rome yeah Yeah. can i say something that has nothing to do with what andy just said i'm saying he shot down twa flight 800 Uh, that seems like it would be against his interests in all conceivable ways i don't know maybe judge i don't don't know business (laughs) good trailing off there i appreciate it okay just briefly so this is the next quotation i'd like to say um on this point the 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 carl icon being outraged and proud of the man of my word stuff Mm -hmm. right uh this is uh from king icon at page 196 uh, Skadden attorney, this is in negotiations between uh, the TWA management and Carl Icahn. Skadden attorney for TWA reminded Carl of his previous assurances that if a better bid than his was put on the table, he wouldn't be the spoiler. Said the attorney, quote, you gave me your word you wouldn't be the spoiler, and now you are being just that. You said you were a man of your word, but you were not behaving like one. If you do this, you are only 50% a man of your word. Indignant, Carl shot back with examples of where he had kept his word. The attorney nodded and said, quote, OK, Carl, let's say you are 75 percent a man of your word. Come on, Icon countered. Give me 80 <laughs> percent. <laughs> I'm at least 80 percent a man of my word. <laughs> the negotiator to the end. Uh, so continuing the story of uh, TWA, uh, just briefly before we move on here, um, uh, uh, I said the Wikipedia article, and it is on uh, corporate rating, or sorry, asset stripping. It just says that Icon at TWA, uh, uh, the particular corporate raid that he did uh, formed the idea of selling a company's assets in order to repay uh, debt and eventually increase the raider's net worth. So it is literally a, a case study in asset stripping or corporate raiding. And and by the way, while he's doing that, uh, you remember the the earlier in the thing, Andy was playing the clip from of him buying stock in Texaco. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was buying stock in Texaco while he was chairman of TWA. Oh, really? <laughs> and he was using the assets of TWA as part of what was his portfolio of assets to make a run at Texaco. Wow. Uh, and other companies as well. 
And uh, so just as we mentioned, uh, TWA, Hedge Clippers, attributes to him 22,000 layoffs, 36,000 pensions destroyed or essentially transferred to the federal government. Um, and uh, Jay, you had a very great quote about him taking a flight in the 1980s. Yes, this is when he's in charge of TWA. Mm-hmm. He's been there for about a year. This is New York Times, uh, 622-86. Uh, when he showed up at a TWA counter to check in for a flight, a ticket agent entered a note in the computer that said the passenger needed assistance because he had, quote, no heart. <laughs> <laughs> it, it went on to say, oh, shit. <laughs> it went on to say, Well, I really wouldn't care to scratch your surface, Mr. Crowley, because I know exactly what I'd find. Instead of a heart, a handbag. Instead of a soul, a suitcase. Instead of an intellect, a cigarette lighter, which doesn't work. And uh, the part where the cigarette lighter doesn't work is the only part of that that's unfair, because the cigarette lighter definitely works. Right. And then he responded, you know, I went to a tough school in Queens. <laughs> <laughs> we used to beat up the little Jewish boys. I'm, I'm personally impressed that they got the music into the, that note. On the computer. <laughs> yeah. She actually scored her note, the flight attendant. This is very effective. Uh, right. In the early 2000s is kind of when he finally walks away from TWA after setting up his uh, discount uh, flight website that destroys it. Well, so he, he has from 85 to 91, 93, he is uh, a chairman and owner of the company and mm-hmm. manager, by the way. So he's acting as manager in a way that he usually doesn't. And then in 93 to 2001, he's fucking with TWA, but as a creditor, not as an owner. Gotcha, mm-hmm. gotcha. Yeah. Um, a yeah. couple of brief quotations, if I or of course, snippets of course. Yeah, yeah. from uh, from the period before the 2000s. So this is when he's making a run at Texaco. Fun fact: uh, one of the members of the equity committee at Texaco uh, in the late 1980s was Wilbur Ross, hmm. future Secretary of Commerce under Trump, uh, and a, an interesting person in self, his own right. Self-proclaimed billionaire. <laughs> he's a self. He's a self-fabricated billionaire. <laughs> he's a self-said billionaire. Mm-hmm. Not self-made, but self-said. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so there's a there's an annual shareholders meeting of uh, Texaco in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is not the friendliest of territories from a tough for a tough boy from Queens. Um, and Wilbur Ross said, "quote The night before, Texaco had a dinner for Texaco retirees." This is a quote Wilbur Ross saying it on record in Car- in King Icon. Uh, These people detested everything Carl stood for: Wall Street, ethnicity, financial engineering. <laughs> Right. This this group I of think, Bobby Fisher's <laughs> friends. Right, right, right. I feel like one of those was maybe more prominent than the other two. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I, I think it was a, a a single tapestry in their minds, possibly. <laughs> but it was like that caught me off guard. Even within a book of things, it caught me off guard. And then the other. This is a quote about Carl Icahn's negotiation negotiation negotiating strategy. Again, from King Icahn. This is from the chapter about Texaco. Mm -hmm. Oh, so Carl Icahn is talking to the head of the equity committee, which is a committee made up of other like shareholders whose job is to like make sure Texaco operates according with shareholder interest is the idea. Mm -hmm. They're working through how to change the bylaws to make Texaco's management more beholden to shareholders. Mm -hmm. And they have sort of different views on what the company should be. So Carl Icahn is like, let's maximize how much I can sell this for tomorrow. And the other guy is like, my family has owned stock in Texaco for centuries. Right, right. A century. Yeah. And we want to continue doing that. Mm-hmm. It's like stewardship versus cash and grab. Okay. So at one point, Carl said, why don't you like me? <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> excuse me, sorry. And Norris, is the head of the equities co- equity committee, answered, I never said I don't like you. We both have similar desires for change in corporate governance rules. But we have different bottom lines. Texaco has 52,000 employees, and I want the company to remain viable in part for them. But you'll come in here and rape the company. Oh. And Carl Icahn said, I'm That's not, not very politically correct. <laughs> no, this is what Carl Icahn said, quote. Here's why that's problematic. <laughs> this is what Carl Icahn said, quote. I'm not go, but you'll come in here and rape, you'll come in here and rape the company. Carl Icahn said, quote, I'm not going to do that. If that's what I wanted, I'd have to raise thirteen billion dollars, and that would take months. <laughs> um, so I think that gives you yeah. a sense of the yeah, 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 definitely. And that's so, also what he says at dinner dates. <laughs> and so Jay mentioned Texaco. Uh, he was eventually successful in forcing a large shareholder buyback at Texaco. 
yep. which uh, uh, benefited him immensely. And uh, other shareholders. Yeah. Um, but um, so I guess we, we probably we don't have time, but I do want to talk very briefly about a couple other companies before we get into the Donald Trump insider trading kind of stuff, as well as the Trump casino. But um, according to Hedge Clippers, uh, Carl Icahn bought a stake in Time Warner in 2005. Uh, he wanted to split up the company. That didn't happen. Uh, but uh, at his instigation, uh, Time Warner uh, laid off about 1,100 people. Um, and eventually in 2006, uh, the company reached a deal with him where Time Warner instituted a $20 billion share buyback um, and then uh, uh, put some of his people on the board and cut about $500 million out of its cost base. And, you know, uh, we, we've talked about this briefly on the podcast, but it should be noted that during the New Deal, share buybacks were outlawed as illegal price manipulation of a, a company. And a lot of the Trump's tax cuts have been go- going into share buybacks. So I think it's at least debatable how much... Certainly, they benefit shareholders, but how much they benefit the long-term health of the company. And the head of the <laughs> SEC looking at whether what companies are doing is proper or not proper, mm-hmm. the head of that SEC interviewed with Carl Icahn right. to get that job. Okay. And, and uh, so that's the Time Warner. And again, uh, uh, Hedge Clippers looked at uh, <laughs> 10 companies, so we'll, we'll put it on the, the Tumblr so you can have a look. Uh, uh, and they found, you know, uh, as we mentioned, uh, uh, these 100,000, 126,000 pension or health benefits cut, uh, more than 35,000 layoffs. Um, so Yahoo was the other case. In 2008, Carl Icahn began buying Yahoo stock. Um, and then he's trying to sell Yahoo to Microsoft. Eventually, he is successful in selling Yahoo's search engine to Microsoft. But... Uh, it's kind Is of the chocolate th- milk you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, uh, but kind of the the shady thing that happens between 2008 and the sale in 2010 is Yahoo, uh, under Carl Icahn's guidance, or at least under his pressure, Yahoo changes their severance program in event of a takeover. So they essentially wipe out severance pay for 15,000 uh, workers. Uh, who uh, would have been affected by this. Right. And uh, eventually about 1,500 workers are laid off, but 15,000 have their severance pay cut. Um, and you know, not long after uh, Microsoft buys Yahoo's search capabilities and the layoffs come, Carl Icahn dumps his shares because his work is done. If you treat yeah. management like labor, what do you treat labor like? <laughs> right, right. Um, and... Uh, um, I guess we'll just kind of skip ahead to um, the Trump Taj Mahal and then the Trump uh, uh, White House, because I think those two kind of feed into each other. And uh, it's it's a really fascinating story, the uh, Trump Taj Mahal, which was the uh, Atlantic City casino that Donald Trump opened in 1990, uh, according to federal indictments. <laughs> it was, uh, That's my favorite band. <laughs> uh, the, the Trump Taj Mahal was, uh, quote, the preferred gambling spot of Russian mobsters in uh, Brooklyn. And apparently um, a member of the 14K triads was... Uh, Yeah, so a Senate subcommittee looked at this and found that a member of uh, the Trump Taj Mahal's VP Foreign Marketing uh, was tied to the organized crime Hong Kong 14K uh, triad linked to murders, extortion, and heroin smuggling. And he at least worked... I'll be right back. (laughs) He at least worked at the Trump Taj Mahal. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC. It's funny every time. It's funny every time. (laughs) He at least worked at the Trump Taj Mahal from 1990 to 95. By the way, I could have sworn a 14K was a thing you had to file at the end of every quarter. (laughs) When I was doing the research for this episode, I got very nostalgic for the video game Sleeping Dogs and sad that they will not make a sequel. Which uh, is neither here nor there, but it's about the triads in Hong Kong. Oh, good game. Ah, but so uh, it's one be- of our listeners will get that. <laughs> that listener is Sean. <laughs> Andy, look, let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, it actually, the other thing I did with my research time was I signed a change.org position to get Square Enix to make Sleeping Dogs <laughs> too. <laughs> so it's like, I, you know, if uh, I won't stick up for like end global warming no, or whatever, God, no. these other change.org positions, but I am one of the 400 people who want to play the sequel to Sleeping Dogs. It would be the change. <laughs> Once it gets enough signatures. Be the change.org. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see a change.org. 
Um, but so uh, Trump's casino, mm-hmm. we, we mentioned the organized crime ties. It also becomes endemic for money laundering yeah. and would settle with the federal government in 2015 for essentially ignoring money, money laundering laws for its entire existence. There is a ton of dicey stuff with all of Trump's building. Yes. It's- staggering yeah it's staggering especially and at the craps table literally the building is staggering <laughs> <laughs> and so uh uh it's a, a fascinating story with icon and trump here because um essentially the the casino is owned through uh the trump entertainment company and according to fortune carl icon eventually becomes the sole lender to the trump entertainment company um and uh, according to hedge clippers uh uh, Trump was paying Icon 12% interest, which was uh, uh, like double the 6% he'd been paying earlier. And that's and like the, in the 90s. Yes. Okay. And this is like, uh, the, Icon's able to juice, I believe, according to the hedge clippers, at least 70 million over four years just because of this interest payments. But so eventually Icon mm. is Trump's sole lender, but uh, he buys, he straight up on buys. On the casino. Uh, yes, okay. on, uh, on Trump Entertainment, which owns his casinos, sure, sure. I guess. Uh, eventually, in 2014, um, Carl Icahn buys Trump Entertainment, and um, uh, according to Hedge Clippers, from uh, tw- 2010, I believe, to 26 uh, to the bankruptcy in 2016, uh, the second bankruptcy, uh, Carl Icahn extracted 350.5 million out of the Trump casinos in Atlantic City and sent that money back to Icon Enterprises, uh, according to Hedge Clippers, while forcing workers to take deep cuts. And we'll talk about those very quickly. It's like the famous saying, the house always wins, <laughs> unless it <laughs> borrowed money from Carl Icon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so he's, he's making a lot of money on interest payments on this debt, but he's also Carl Icon, as well as Trump before him, but Carl Icon in particular, he's playing hardball negotiation with the 3,000 workers at this Trump casino who were union workers. And according to Hedge Clippers, um, Icon implemented an overall 35% reduction in compensation for workers who average, at the time, they averaged about 12.50 an hour. These are casino workers at Trump's casino or now Icon's. Mm-hmm. They were making about 12.50 an hour. He also eliminated health insurance plans. Uh, he eliminated more than three million in pension contributions. He eliminated paid lunch break for uh, employees at this casino. Who does he think he is, Jeff Bezos? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he also permitted unlimited su- uh, subcontracting for food and beverage service at the casino. And all of this is essentially a way of doing the uh, end run around uh, the unions. He also incle- increased employee workloads. They, if Hedge Clipper says house cl- housekeepers at the casino were now expected to clean 16 rooms a day up from 14 rooms a day. <laughs> And uh, the union uh, appealed... Squeeze where you can. Exactly. Uh, the union appealed this uh, 2014 bankruptcy, which is where Carl Icahn came in and bought up the remnants in bankruptcy and then started qu- squeezing the union even harder. The union appealed that. The Supreme Court chose not to hear the case. And um, Carl Icahn fought back and forth with the union before eventually shutting it down in, I believe, October 2016, resulting in 3,000 union workers being laid off. And he would later in 2017 sell the remnants to uh, Hard Rock. Yes, it is now the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino Atlantic City. No wonder the white working class is so angry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Briefly on the Trump Casino, Mm -hmm. uh, Trump uh, at one point was insistent that it it had more value as long as it was called the Trump uh, Casino. Trump Taj Mahal, of course. In Icon's opinion, the only real downside to shedding the Trump name was the expense that would be associated with changing the signage. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so, uh, and then during Icon's operation uh, from 2014 to late 2016, the <coughs> U.S. Department of the Treasury Financial Crimes Enforcement settled the investigation for money laundering with a $10 million civil fine for, quote, significant and long-standing money laundering violations, which were described as, quote, willful and repeated. Uh, That's like not even a slap on more than one knuckle. <laughs> right, That's right. a slap on a single knuckle. And basically, they were just ignoring all record-keeping and reporting mm-hmm. uh, requirements of the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, but it is interesting. I mean, you know, it's just a corporate raid uh, where Icon is, of course, paying himself this hundreds of millions in interest payments while squeezing the workers and labor and eventually wiping out about 3,000 union workers and then selling off the remnants to uh, Hard Rock, who can now contract the thing without union workers. So it's a, a, it's a typical tale of what has happened to American workers with both corporate raiders, private equity, et cetera, et cetera. And, and con- consistent with the spirit of rock and roll. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I think we've we've drilled this point into the ground. He uh, puts the hard this, in hard rock. <laughs> throughout this uh, uh, the mm-hmm. course of this podcast, but uh, the significance of the hard rock story is that Two. this is kind of the genesis of Trump and Icon's relationship. Even though they have a partial falling out, and Trump is clearly a little hurt by uh, Icon saying that his name on the casino is worthless. <laughs> Icon also had some sort of quote about like, "How can the name be valuable if all the Trump casinos keep going bankrupt or something?" <laughs> that's an, a that's a very good point. <laughs> He's got that big dick energy. I mean, like. <laughs> I don't respect him, but he does have game. Well, and that, that's the thing. Like, Icons is a success story, and Trump <laughs> admires that. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, yes, you can argue about if Icon has created actual value for the economy, but certainly within the rules of the game, as they are written, he has made a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. No. Whereas Trump has... Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, at many points, been bailed out uh, by creditors and just had his name, but his actual control of these assets stripped and is mm-hmm. clearly not worth as much money as he claims to be worth. Mm-hmm. I will say, though, for those creditors bailing him out, good long-term investment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just uh, just as a play to get Gorsuch. Is- uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but so The Gorsuch play, they call it. <laughs> but so, because Icon was Trump's sole creditor for a time and uh, certainly has a relationship with the guy. Um, uh, Trump named him not long after uh, his election. He named him to be uh, the special advisor to regulation uh, in the Trump White House, which is a position he would hold from, I believe, March 2017 to August 2017. Uh, And then he would step down when The New Yorker began looking at a clear case of insider trading that he engaged in from this, and then the Trump White House distanced itself from it. They said he had um, never, in fact, been there. Yes, they did. Not We've only always they... been at war with these days. <laughs> what? Uh, I do like that. It's like just clear tweets uh, from Icon announcing that he's coming on board and from yeah. Tw- Trump announcing yeah. that he's coming on board. And, and then, then like, when that happens, nope. stocks in companies that Icon has an investment in flourishing as a result <laughs> and derivatives markets changing just based on that. All right. Well, so the the two cases of insider trading, the the quick one is the the steel stocks. Mm-hmm. So according to Think Pro, uh, Progress, they wrote this article in March 2018. Icon dumped about thirty million dollars in steel related stock uh, about a week before Trump announced tariffs on steel. And uh, Trump has, for the record, said that uh, he regularly what great timing. <laughs> he regularly speaks with Icon. He's a and, comic, you know. He's got good timing. <laughs> Can't get to Caroline's without great timing. <laughs> And, and so the Think Progress story. How do you get to Caroline's leverage, leverage, <laughs> leverage. <laughs> uh, so the the Think Progress story is that Icon uh, systematically sold off nearly a million shares of uh, Manti Walk Company Incorporated between February 12 and February 22, 2018. Uh, it's it was a leading manufa- It is a leading manufacturer of cranes and other heavy duty equipment, and it is highly. Oh, Highly dependent on steel, much of which is imported. Uh, seven days after this sell-off, Trump disclosed at a White House event that he was planning a 25% tariff on steel imports. So uh, this kind of $30 million sell-off has been alleged to be insider trading because, as we know, Trump and Icon talk at least semi-regularly. Mm-hmm. And uh, Like just a phone call late at night, like, what did you think of the news today? Right. Like, is like one of the things they might do. Mm-hmm. Trump could say something like, I'm thinking about these steel tariffs. I'm thinking about putting them in. Not even, he literally could not be thinking in his head, I bet Icon uses this information. Right, right, right. And it's also possible that phone call didn't happen. Mm-hmm. But, you know. It's suspicious. Yes. Should um, be looked and into. that is how this went down. And so. Hey the there, other- Chris. <laughs> <Harris. laughs> Every time. The other story here is a little more complicated, but I think we can truncate it. It's the subject of the New Yorker long piece that would eventually force the White House to not only fire Carl Icahn, but erase his existence, Joseph Stalin style, <laughs> by saying that he had never worked there. They took um, a photograph of a regulation with nobody standing <laughs> next to it. <laughs> Um, but so, uh, according to the New Yorker, the actual title that Carl Icahn came in with was, quote, special advisor to the president on regulatory reform. This was announced in December 2016, um, before Trump was formally sworn in. As we mentioned, he held this title until late August 2017. Um, and so Carl Icahn, uh, had a company that he owned called CVR Energy, which was a refinery, 
Um, according to the New Yorker, under the Renewable Fuel Standard, which was a law passed under George W. Bush uh, to promote ethanol and biofuels, because uh, the ethanol and biofuels have a outsized influence in the presidential nominating process, thanks to Iowa and corn uh, subsidies. Uh, so this law requires refiners such as Carl Icons to either blend ethanol into their products or to purchase credits known as Renewable Identification Numbers, or RINs, from refiners that do. And so Carl Icahn's company uh, didn't blend ethanol, but they were buying these RIN credits, and the RIN credits uh, progressively became more and more expensive. So under the Obama administration, Carl Icahn was frustrated that he couldn't get the EPA person for Obama on the phone to complain about these, and so he made it a big issue with Trump, and in fact specifically spoke to Trump about it. And then weirdly enough, in September before uh, the election, uh, the Trump team released a white paper, which uh, the New Yorker alleges uh, might have been written by Carl Icahn, oh, wow. which uh, uh, essentially said that they were going to do away with this uh, uh, fuel renewable fuel standard requirement via executive order. Then when questioned about it, the Trump team uh, re-released the paper, re- removing that bullet point mm-hmm. and being like, no, there was a mistake. We weren't actually going to do that. Um and so what smooth, real smooth operators. Right. And, and so what happens is um, in February 27th, uh, this is right after Trump's inauguration, uh, 2017, uh, the news leaked that Carl Icahn had had a sit down with um, the head of uh, one of the um, industry groups that essentially defends this. Uh, um, uh, uh, what is it called? The uh, renewable fuel standard. Yes. The, the sit down with one of the industry groups that defends this renewable fuel standard. And uh, this guy, according to The New Yorker, alleges that Carl Icahn told him directly <laughs> that the president was going to issue an executive order ending this uh, uh, renewable fuel standard. And so he says that he was kind of faced with this, you know, because Carl Icahn has this title, a special advisor to the president, and talks with the president regularly he was kind of faced with okay well the president is going to do away with the standard so believes he's speaking for the president exactly so he says all right well since this is already going to happen i have to negotiate in a way to try and save something when carter page goes to moscow and says i am interested in having better relationships with moscow (laughs) you know he's speaking for the president right and so according to the new yorker it was the this group is called the renewable fuels association uh, and uh, on February 27th, this news leaked that the Renewable Fuels Association, after speaking with Carl Icahn, uh, announced it would end its long-held opposition to changing the point of obligation and side with Icahn in his point to shift the obligation away from the refineries like CVR, the one Icahn owns. And the idea of this is that essentially Icahn wanted to move the renewable fuel standard so other people have to buy the credits. Mm. And so this news leaks out to Bloomberg, uh, which... Uh, 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 four days later, Bloomberg uh, News leaks the story, and uh, cor- according to uh, New Yorker, corn and gasoline prices go berserk, as understandably sure, they sure. would. Um, and so uh, a weird thing happens where during this time, Carl Icahn has, uh, in the lead up to this, he's begun selling these RINs, because again, these RINs, these renewable uh, credits, these are traded on the market. So he begins selling these things, and then the price collapses as soon as this announcement comes out, and then he begins buying them back much cheaper. Wow. So it is like, it's a pretty clear case of... There's at it, least an argument. Right. There is at least a theory of how he was manipulating the market. Not just like trading on insider information, but making the market. Yeah, I mean, he knows he knows how to manipulate. He knows what to say and do to get his way, and uh, like his... Uh, future wife said at that point, uh, he's a bull. He doesn't even have to kill the regulation to move the market on the noise that the regulation might get killed. Uh And then if that possibility of it changes the price, he can use that change in price and arbitrage, that change in price. And arbitraging price is a thing he's extremely good at. Does that mean that's exactly what he did here? It it doesn't mean that for sure, 
but it means it's worth looking into. Right. And so essentially the story uh, for now ends this way. In May 2017, uh, various senators, mostly Democrats, obviously, they write to the heads of the SEC, the EPA, the Commodities and the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, uh, calling on them to investigate this. Mm. And so according to The New Yorker, in May, the... Uh, and the SEC was like, we don't do that. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, my, literally, yes. <laughs> as I learned in my interview... Carl Icahn is an important person. <laughs> uh, so in, uh, in May, according to New Yorker, uh, Commodities Futures Trading Commission replies to the senator's letter saying the agency would not be investigating Icahn or his refinery CVR because RINs, even though they are commodities, do not trade on the futures market, and therefore the agency has no jurisdiction to look into the ma matter. And then uh, the New Yorker uh, opines that, quote, by this logic, the $15 billion market for renewable fuel credits is not regulated by any government agency. And we yeah, that's the one he's a regulatory advisor. Right. right. And right. that's the first thing he looks at. By the way, he's a regulatory advisor for all regulations. Yes. The one he goes at hard in the month after he is, uh, after his president is inaugurated and he's the advisor to the president about it, right. is this one specific thing on this one very narrow regulation that affects a refinery that costs him $200 million a year. Yes. Is the, that's the regulation he cares about. Yes. Of all federal regulation. And we mentioned earlier in this New Yorker profile, they also mention as Trump was picking his nominees for the cabinet, including Steve Mnuchin and the head of the SEC, Scott mm -hmm. Pruitt at the EPA, all of these people had to meet with Carl Icahn and be interviewed. Mm -hmm. And Trump, of course, listened to his suggestions on this. Carl Icahn made a lot of quotes pra praising both Scott Pruitt and Mnuchin and such. Mm -hmm. So it is interesting where it's like, okay, so they get this letter to look into this guy who got them their job. Right, right. And then they're like, no, we're not going to be investigating yeah, this guy. Yeah. I feel like at that interview, he just like pushes a piece of paper across the table and just says regulations, question mark, in two boxes. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and they like crumple the paper up and throw it to the ground. He's like, you've passed. <laughs> Um, but so uh, just one other thing from this case, uh, Elliot Spitzer, the former New York state attorney general says that the, even if the federal government won't look into this, the New York state attorney general should have jurisdiction to look into this. So, uh, if you're listening and you live in New York, please vote for Zephyr teach out for attorney general. Can I, can I add a happy point? On of this? course. So in November, 2017, Carl Icahn got something, mm -hmm. which was a subpoena oh. mm -hmm. from the Southern district of New York. Oh, uh, for his role as a Trump advisor relative to this stuff. Oh, that's good. So whether SDNY that SDNY is looking at him. Yeah, at whether that actually leads to anything, who knows? But you know, when I get a subpoena, probably if I hire a lawyer. This uh, podcast is financed by Selena and Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so unfortunately... Well, I look forward to the new career of uh, the U.S. attorney in charge of the Southern District of New York. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, He's going to be external vice president <laughs> at CVR. <laughs> I love the plot of You Got Served 6. <laughs> Um, oh, so dancing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're dancing. All right. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's just too much with Carl Icahn to get to everything, but um, we can kind of wrap up here with just what we haven't been able to get to and what we've kind of learned about the man. But I would, for example, this audio from his uh, divorce proceedings. Oh, you poor sad multimillionaire! <laughs> I feel so sorry for you. <laughs> Wide underestimate. You uh, are nothing but a suit. <laughs> Um, so one interesting thing I found, I believe this is from the New Yorker piece, uh, when people tried to cite Carl Icahn's charitable contribution, the main one they cited was that he has built eight charter schools in the Bronx. Yeah. And if you are not aware, charter schools are for-profit operations. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and his uh, wife runs these charter schools, and I believe his uh, sons and other family members are part of that organization, which is a very common tactic by billionaires to employ your family in your not not for profit. <laughs> well, he's also done a lot uh, to encourage Latino uh, businessers, business mm -hmm. owners, uh, entrepreneurs, specifically through Herbalife. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we talked about it a bit more on the Bill Ackman episode, but uh, he was involved in trying to short squeeze Bill Ackman on Herbalife and made a big investment in what is, by all regards, a pyramid scheme. Right, right. Uh, allegedly. Well, there uh, was a FTC settlement, and yes. now... Under the terms of that, they promise to only be 30% a pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> just like uh, uh, Carl Icahn is 80% honest. <laughs> a man of his word. Oh, uh, we didn't have time to get to this, but one of my favorite things is that in the 1990s, Carl Icahn attempted a corporate raid on c- for control of Marvel Comics, and the uh, company's CEO at the time called... Uh, it's likened negotiating to Carl Icahn with negotiating to terrorists. Yeah, no, that <laughs> wow. makes sense. And, and I just like the idea of Carl like He was not successful in his takeover of Marvel Comics, but I do like the idea of him taking over Marvel Comics and then asset stripping the Batman universe. <laughs> <laughs> Like, he sells Batman's dead parents to DC Comics. <laughs> or no, Batman's DC. Sorry. Now people yeah, are going to Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, we're going to get some angry You know, I think we can all, we all understand. If you're watching this, po- if you're listening to the podcast, you know that Sean McCarthy is a sleeping dog's head. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> that so, is where his passion, you know, people, some people like comics and it's, everyone has their thing. He sells Spider-Man's Uncle Ben to DC Comics <laughs> <laughs> and he sells With Carm- great leverage comes Uncle Ben for free. <laughs> <laughs> he sells carnage to 20th century fox um <laughs> but yes takes away luke cage's pension can i on the charity thing of course make a brief point so one impressive one good thing about carl icon is he did sign the giving pledge right yeah. but he has not yet decided how to distribute the money there is an article from inside philanthropy uh april 6 2015 the title of the article is carl icon will give away 20 billion dollars but when? <laughs> and where will the money go? Because he hasn't done it yet. Because Carl Icahn uses the money as his ship that he raids other ships with. Right. right. There's literally a quotation, which I think is such a key to understanding Carl Icahn. My money is my army. I need my army around me. Mm-hmm. Because the money is how he buys the stock, which is how he intimidates and pressures the companies that he intimidates and yes, pressures. Yes, and the money is his score. Yes, so. it's not just the score, it is also the troops. Right, right, right. That's the thing that he uses to go at the companies. And so uh, that's a key to understanding it. The money is the troops. Yeah. And then in his stand-up mm-hmm. set he said, now give it up for the troops. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he wants people to support the troops. Absolutely. And so I guess uh, to summarize, there's an interesting quote from uh, Mr. Icon. Um, he, according to the New Yorker, uh, Mark Stevens, who we mentioned is Icon's biographer, and he wrote the book King uh, Icon. Uh, he says, Carl Icon once told me, quote, I don't believe in the word fair. It's a human concept that became conventional wisdom. Uh, spoken like a true philosophy <laughs> graduate. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that kind of sums up the guy. He just, uh, he loves business, he loves making a profit, and he regards his almost $20 billion fortune as a way of keeping score, and he sold his yacht because while many people would retire with that much money, there's nothing that brings him joy like late night negotiating and squeezing companies and all this, and the consequences for labor and people under him be damned. Um, So I guess anything else we learned uh, from Carl Icahn? I'll give you another one that really happened. (laughs) In all of like his uh, public speaking, whether it's the commencements or um, just like investor talks and stuff, he always is going for a laugh. And I think uh, one of Carl uh one of his best skills is he can talk at you until you go, I guess that was technically funny. Like he is very good at, you know, belaboring the point long enough to where you're like, I, if I don't laugh, this guy's going to continue talking at my face right now. And he does impressions. And, and here's how Jamil comes in. Ha, ha, ha. You, you can, you can sell a goddamn plane. He's uh, wearing a hat and squinty glasses <laughs> while he does this. Look, uh, I guess keep your eyes uh, focused on the New York State Attorney General and the Southern District of New York. Zephyr uh, teach out. Yeah. Zephyr teach out. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll see if uh, the alleged insider trading comes to anything. But uh, Carl Icahn is an innovative corporate raider, um, a brilliant stand-up comedian, yep. and you can catch him at Caroline's. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make sure to plug Carl Icahn's dates before we get oh, yeah. out of here. <laughs> Be sure to uh, rate and subscribe his podcast. <laughs> you might catch him at Laughing Buddha. He does spots there. <laughs> <laughs> he does and, clubs and colleges all around the country. I, I just it, enjoy this podcast before he sells Andy Palmer. <laughs> it would be great if it turns out Carl Icahn owns Laughing Buddha. <laughs> that uh, actually feels very like him. Uh, but anyways, uh, before we get out of here, Jay Welsh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so uh, much for having me. Anything to plug, we'll certainly link to whatever you want in the description. You can follow me on Twitter at Welsh Jay. Uh, 
And that's uh, all I got. All right. Well, uh, Jay Welch, a very funny comedian in the New York area, and he helped us out a lot with this episode. So thank you. We'd love to have you back in the future. Anytime. And uh, thanks for listening to Grub Stakers. We'll be back next week. Sean P. McCarthy here. Andy Palmer. Yogi Polywalt. Steve Jeffries. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening. Bye, everybody. <laughs>